you know, we can kind of get a window into time by looking at a stand in mangroves like this, and this is what a lot of Miami look like. Right. There's tons of birds and fish. Also, just having the additional understanding that they're helping us deal with one of the biggest threats to our community is um, makes me feel really appreciative of them. Rachel Silverstein spends a lot of time promoting mangroves, a type of tree that thrives in salty coastal environments and often has large above-ground root systems. I think people who don't understand mangroves or don't want mangroves in their community really are, you know, probably reflecting different values. The reason these trees need advocates is because they're pissing a lot of people off. But Florida might need them now more than ever. So in terms of climate change, what is the situation with Miami? How bad is it? We're basically all at sea level. We have hundreds of billions of dollars of real estate that's all very vulnerable. And we have this very porous limestone geology where water moves really easily through the rock. Um, so the water is not only coming from the coast, it's also coming up from the ground when the water table uh, reaches the surface through these holes in the rock. Mangroves are native to Florida. They were once abundant, covering large areas, but by the early 1900s, most of them were gone, removed to make way for large metropolitan areas and seafront properties. The mangroves that remain provide substantial benefits for humans. One estimate suggests that mangroves help avoid $65 billion in damage caused by flooding globally and protect 15 million people from the most severe impacts of storms every year. Because of this, they get planted along coasts around the world. And many environmentalists in Miami want to join in on this trend. Beyond just the use of concrete structures called seawalls, they think mangroves might offer additional protections and provide an elegant and adaptable solution. What is it about the way that these trees are structured that actually makes a difference? So there's a lot of different ways that mangroves are helping with coastal flooding. Um, one of them is that they break up wave energy is actually through friction and shear because when a wave crashes into a mangrove, it actually dissipates um, and the trees absorb a lot of that energy. So they make the waves less strong, less, exactly. less powerful. When a wave hits a seawall, it's actually getting bigger. Environmentalists and policymakers made these arguments when they proposed to plant mangroves along the shore in a park in Morningside, an affluent community in Miami. But the idea didn't go over all that well among certain residents. So why were the residents against the mangroves? What's their argument? So some people feel that mangroves block their water view, but they also end up trapping trash. Mangroves can also have a lot of mosquitoes, it kind of seems to me like mangroves need an image rehab. I think people are going to have to come to terms with the fact that living in Miami in an era of climate change and sea level rise is going to look different. A city commissioner put forth a ban that would have eliminated the city's ability to plant new mangroves in city parks, an outcome community members fought until the commissioner recanted. Part of the reason why certain residents don't want to see more mangroves in parks is because they're protected by the state which means trimming them down could have people drowning in paperwork and permit applications. In Morningside, residents pushed back on planting more mangroves, and it worked. The trees were removed from the park's redesign plan. So this is the Palm Garden. It's been here since 1953. It's part of the original design of Morningside Park. And we're up to 189 palms, representing 126 different species. Elvis Cruz is a lifelong Miami resident who's called the neighborhood of Morningside home since 1977. This is a coconut palm. It is the only plant in the world that has a seed that contains drinkable water. We tend to take it for granted, but it really is spectacular. He was a central figure in the fight to prevent additional mangroves from getting planted along the shore in this local park. And unfortunately, politics can get in the way of the enjoyment of a park. And lately, the environmentalists, in their fanaticism, want to harm this park by taking away the uh, beautiful waterfront that we enjoy, even though the science shows that they're wrong. Right. That looks a little better. When did you first hear about the plan to add additional mangroves to this park as part of a climate resilience plan? 
uh, probably about three or four years ago. The drawings eventually came out, and here they are. And you can see that they wanted to put mangroves along the shoreline. So this seawall, this is resilience. The narrow shoreline planting of mangroves is 100% effective at blocking the view of the bay. It's a very popular belief, even though it's completely wrong, that mangroves can protect a shoreline from storm surge. It sounds like there's a lot of emotion behind what you're saying. Like there's, like you really, really are, you feel very strongly about these mangroves. For mangroves to have the big environmental benefits, you need a lot of them. Just a small planting along a shoreline or a small area in a park, that really doesn't do a heck of a lot. Cruz has a point. Mangroves have more of an impact when planted in larger numbers. But that doesn't mean he wants to see a proposal for an even larger number of mangroves. The bottom line is that he doesn't want any. The argument that I've been hearing is they reduce wave action. Um, they will break up the waves a little bit. And yes, it's true that more mangroves is better, but a few mangroves does not mean no change. They'll, they'll just say things that aren't quantified. I mean, there have been a number of studies that have quantified Correct. it. Correct, and let's talk about those studies. So here's an example, perfect example of what we're talking about. So this is a study quoted by many mangrove enthusiasts, and here you have it. One kilometer of mangroves, which is two thirds of a mile, 3,280 feet. If the mangrove forest is that wide, it would decrease the level of the water at most 9.4 centimeters. Yeah. Can I have this Storm document? Search. You may, please. Yeah. Okay, great. I, I read it, I read it. Is the conclusion removed from this? I didn't bring the whole thing because it's just- Yeah, because the conclusion says that actually even a small area of mangroves can make a difference. In How much? Study. How much? Here's the deal. Yes. I think that you just don't like the mangroves. Uh, it's not that I don't like or dislike the mangroves, it's that the undeniable fact is that mangroves do block the view of the water. Do you feel like you're the villain in this situation? You know, the person who's, who's against a tree? No, I feel like I am that, that little kid that said, wait a minute, the emperor's not wearing any clothes and I'm being pilloried because I dare speak the truth. For residents who value their views above anything else, the idea that a plant can help a little, that's not gonna get you anywhere. This is on the market for $16.9 million. This is what Miami real estate is all about. These high ceilings, lots of glass, tons of light, and spectacular views. Nelson Gonzalez is a realtor in Miami who sells mansions like this one. When it comes to real estate in Miami, what do buyers care about? It's really all about the view. Number one. It's number one, for sure. Okay. If mangroves were covering the entire view here, uh, this would absolutely have a major effect on the price, probably half. When you have buyers come look at a property like this, do they talk to you about sea level rise? Do they talk to you about flooding? Do they worry about that? It is definitely starting to be on the forefront of the conversation. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm gonna be perfectly honest with you. When I see this, I say, this is beautiful. This is unbelievable. And also, <laughs> I, I'd be terrified to buy a place like this. Why? I'd be terrified because of flooding, because of storm surge. What if you're a boater and you have your yacht behind the house? I just, yeah. You gotta think big, baby. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, okay. Mangroves might seem like a hard sell in Miami, Hey, how's it going? I'm Benji. But that's not the case everywhere in Florida. Myra. Hi, Ariel. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, thank you for coming. Oh, yeah. Two hours north of Miami, Benjamin Stute works as an environmental scientist for Palm Beach County, where officials have, for the past two decades, built mangrove islands off the coast, specifically to restore wildlife habitat and act as a buffer against waves. Why has this area put so much effort into planting mangroves here? We have always understood that mangroves are, are so essential to wildlife habitat. And now that, that has kind of evolved over time as, as climate change uh, has really accelerated. Um, we've also started to realize other benefits of mangroves. What people are talking about in Miami is planting sometimes, you know, 100 mangroves in front of a seawall. 
And the question is, is that actually going to do anything? Does it actually help in terms of flooding and dissipating wave energy? You know, seawalls, uh, they end up failing because of that constant battering of boat wakes and wave energy. Um, and so by planting even a small project that we'll see today, um, you can dramatically increase the lifespan of some of this infrastructure. So we're at Snook Islands Natural Area. This is that big initial island creation project, almost 100 acres of habitat. And the oldest islands, the oldest mangroves, have been in the ground for about 20 years at this point. Planting mangroves isn't going to stop global warming, but they could help humans and wildlife adapt to its increasing threat, which in this case was convincing enough, at least when the bulk of the mangroves were planted on islands offshore. I know that there are some people who don't at all like the idea that mangroves will be blocking their view. What do you say to those people? I'd bring them somewhere like Snook Islands. When, when we do these projects in front of the communities, it's not 100% of the residents who are up there cheerleading. Uh, but we can move from maybe a slight minority to an overwhelming majority. You know, what you're describing is, is patience, right? At what point does that patience need to run out? Oof, that's, I mean, that's heavy, right? We're, we're not on the best track right now. I think restoring mangrove habitat uh, is essential because of what we've already lost. Um, is planting mangroves in a silver bullet? No, I mean, this has got to be a multi-pronged approach. Man, if, if we don't do anything, we just keep plowing forward, uh, we're gonna have to, you know, find some other places to live. I think you make some, some sound arguments. I hear you. Mm -hmm. I understand that, that you feel like, f for them, it's the people who are pro-mangrove, that it's 100% benefit, and you think that they're overemphasizing the benefit, that they are mischaracterizing it. I hear you. What I'm hearing from you mm -hmm. is that what you value when it comes to a public park mm -hmm. is open grassland and, and a water view. Yeah. And I think that there are a number of people in Miami who value something different. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. no. Yeah. Yeah. There are. And when I try to engage them to have the logical, scientific discussion, they don't want to talk to me. Yeah. And in my past life experience, when someone doesn't want to engage with me on the facts, it's because they are probably fearful that the facts are not in their favor. I will counter that by saying that sometimes some people don't want to engage with other people because they don't think that they can change that person's mind. They don't think that their mind is open to being changed. That's exactly the impression I have from them. You live in this community, you love this mm -hmm. community. Yeah. You are extremely engaged. Sure. Is there a world where you would be willing to sacrifice yes. the view yes. in order to prevent yes. massive flooding, yes. people losing their homes, destruction of property, yes. people losing their lives. Like, yes. is there a world where you feel comfortable with How many yeses do I have to say? So, here is what I would like to see happen. And this is a plan you came up with yourself? Well, yes and no. It is a plan that I certainly endorse, but this is what the city does all over town, all over Miami. This is all throughout the world, basically. Mm -hmm. Here's the water. They put the seawall mm -hmm. at the water's edge. Mm -hmm because this is what's gonna protect you from sea level rise, not the plants. This is what's gonna protect more from storm surge. So raising the seawall. Yes, if the seawall were installed today at six feet NAVD, six feet above sea level, you can call it, which is the new requirement, it would be about four feet higher than that walkway. So, so it'd be about, about this high. That's pretty high. It is. So the picnic table would also be raised. The benches would also be raised. The walkway would be raised. I'm Michael Learmont, Editor-in-Chief of Vice News. Too often, traditional news outlets shy away from the real stories and experiences of those living through global conflicts, not Vice News. Our reporters are on the ground, fearlessly covering the human stories that shape our world. You and millions of others can continue to read, watch, and listen to Vice News for free but we hope you'll consider making a one-time or ongoing contribution of any size at vice.com slash contribute. Every contribution, no matter how big or small, helps support the journalism Vice News brings to you every day. Thank you.